Before World War II, the islands of the Philippines were governed by the Commonwealth of the Philippines in the process of gaining independence from the United States. As part of this process, under the National Defense Act of 1935 specifically, the Americans helped establish the armed forces of the Philippines and its army branch, the Philippine Army. Unfortunately, the Second World War broke out before the Philippines gained independence and before its military was properly ready, and just 10 hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese invaded Luzon, the largest of the Philippine Islands. The next day, the US Army forces in the Far East was forged, and under its command fell units of the Philippine Army, tasked with staving off the Japanese offensive. Crippled by Pearl Harbor, this joint American-Filipino force suffered disastrous defeats on the Bataan Peninsula and the island of Corregidor in April and May 1942. This was preceded by the flight of the Commonwealth government to the United States, where it operated in exile and marked the beginning of Japanese occupation. But the Philippine army was by no means exterminated and its fragments, led in many cases by USA, FFE and other US officers and aided in part by several non-US associated movements, formed hundreds of resistance and guerrilla units, killing their occupiers from the inside right up until allies returned in full force in Operation Musketeer launched in October 1944. Hopefully that set the scene for the rest of this video, in which we're going to discuss Filipino guerrilla units in the Second World War, a topic deserving of far more attention than it gets. Now, obviously, we're not going to cover hundreds of guerrilla units here, but we can mention a few, starting with those led, sponsored, or otherwise associated with USA FFE and other US officers and commands. In January 1942, US General Douglas MacArthur approved the formation of a guerrilla HQ in the Zambales Mountains on Luzon, headed by Major Claude Thorpe who managed to pass through Japanese lines on Bataan and avoid capture. The force attached to this command was deemed the Luzon Guerrilla Force or LGF and one of its constituent forces was the West Luzon Guerrilla Force led by US Army Captain Ralph Maguire before he was beheaded by Filipinos under his command. After Maguire's beheading, US Colonel Giles Merrill took charge and under this man served Ramon Magsese a Filipino who was commissioned as a captain and who ultimately commanded a guerrilla unit some 10,000 strong. Magsaysa played a vital role in clearing the Japanese from the coast of Zimbales in the lead up to crucial allied landings in Operation Musketeer. Surviving the war, Magsaysa used his experience in guerrilla warfare to fight communist guerrillas persisting in the Philippines, which we'll get to soon and he then went on to become the seventh president of the Philippines in 1953, keeping close ties with the US and founding the Manila Pact of 1954. Another constituent of the LGF was the East Central Luzon Guerrilla Army or ECLGA, led by US Major Edwin Ramsey, who grew the ECLGA to a force of almost 40,000 and made use of stolen and improvised weapons, constructing, in Ramsey's words, arms out of sort of pipes that were used as shotguns. The ECLGA also gathered intelligence and distributed counter-propaganda, aiming to keep the local Filipinos hopeful for an allied counter-invasion and the end of Japanese occupation. US Army Reserve Lieutenant Robert Lapham served in the Philippine scouts during the Japanese invasion. Evading capture, he first assisted the aforementioned US Major Claude Thorpe in a sabotage and recon mission at the Clark Air Base in Luzon and then went to lead a guerrilla force of his own, the Luzon Guerrilla Armed Force or LGAF, which was distinct from the LGF. By May 1945, the LGAF had grown to include more than 13,000 Filipinos and 79 air squadrons. 
Of note, the LGAF sabotaged Japanese positions in the lead up to the Battle of Luzon in Operation Musketeer, and it also gathered vital intel which inspired Allied Special Forces to undertake the raid at Cabanatuan, in which more than 500 Allied POWs were freed from almost certain death at the hands of their Japanese captors. After the war, Lapam received the Distinguished Service Cross for his efforts in the Philippines and during his guerrilla years, he was creeping around with a $1 million bounty on his head, placed there by the Japanese. In Lapam's words, most of the guerrilla leaders who died in the war were killed or captured in its first year. Lapam attributes the survival of those who weren't killed or captured to their ability to eliminate or chase off spies and collaborators, establish effective spy systems of their own, win the support and trust of civilians, and know when to hide out and when to show themselves. Filipino USA FFE Captains Juan Pajota and Eduardo Johnson were trained in a camp near Cabanatuan City and returning to the camp after withdrawing from Bataan in January 1942, they found it in the hands of the Japanese, who were using the camp to house Allied POWs. Yes, this is the very same Cabanatuan camp we just discussed. Forming a Filipino guerrilla unit under his own charge, but in league with Lieutenant Robert Lapham's LGAF, Bahota and Johnson assisted in the raid on Cabanatuan directly, working alongside US Army Rangers and Alamo Scouts. Bahota and Johnson's force, some 200 strong, used their intimate knowledge of the terrain and enemy activity as well as their rapport with the locals to provide the rangers and scouts with vital intel and tactics, pretty much preventing one straight up suicidal offensive, suppressing their movements by persuading the locals to muzzle their dogs and setting up roadblocks to rebound Japanese reinforcements camped over a nearby river, among other things. They even persuaded some locals to help transport escaped allied POWs away in water buffalo carts, and the raid would likely have been a huge failure without these two Filipino USA FFE captains and the guerrillas under their charge. Another famed guerrilla unit was Philippine Military Academy cadet Terry Adavoso's Hunters ROTC. Before Japanese occupation, Adavoso and another 300 academy cadets were told they were too young to fight in the war and they were sent home from the academy. But Adavoso wouldn't have a bar of it and he organized the cadets into a guerrilla unit which assisted USA FFE forces by providing intel and spreading propaganda, initially. After the Philippines fell, however, Adavoso and his hunters got a little bolder, banding together with other resistance groups to take out Japanese spies and ultimately carry out raids with seized weaponry. On the 24th of June 1944, the hunters raided the new Bilibid prison and on the 23rd of February 1945, the unit positioned itself around the Japanese POW camp Los Banos and provided intel to the US 11th Airborne Division assisting in the liberation of more than 2,000 Allied military personnel and civilians. The Hunters also fought alongside the US Army in the devastating 1945 Battle of Manila, but these are just a few of the unit's many contributions. Now, as we've alluded to, not all Filipino guerrilla units were associated with the Americans and some, like the aforementioned communist guerrillas, came into violent conflicts with US associated guerrillas and military forces during and after the war. The Huk Balahap, or just the Hux, was a Philippine guerrilla movement founded partly on communist ideology. The armed forces of the Hux were led by Filipino Luis Taruk, who, with his vice commander, Castro Aliandrino, met with Claude Thorpe of the LGF. While they agreed to cooperate against a common enemy, the Hucks were known for their attempts at derailing US associated guerrilla operations. USAAC Staff Sergeant Ray Hunt led his own 3,000 strong guerrilla force in the Philippines, and he described the Hucks as not above plundering and torturing ordinary Filipinos and treacherous enemies of all other guerrillas. During the war, the Hucks received little support from US associated forces, but despite this, they boasted a strength of 15,000 by 1945. After the war, the Hucks clashed with American forces returning to the Philippines, inciting a lengthy rebellion which was, as we said, 
brought to a halt in 1954 by ex-guerrilla warrior and 7th President of the Philippines, Ramon Muxese. Another non-US associated guerrilla force was the Wachi, which was composed of Chinese and Filipino Chinese immigrants and founded from the Chinese General Labor Union of the Philippines and the Chinese Communist Party. The Wachi grew to a strength of around 700 throughout Japanese occupation and served under the Hux until 1943, after which it operated on its own. Like the Hux, the Wachi collaborated with US associated units against a common enemy. It's also worth mentioning that the Islamized Moro rebels of the Philippines fought their Japanese occupiers too, but they refused to cooperate with other guerrilla forces, going as far to straight up attack them, literally boasting about being at war with the Japanese, the Filipinos, and the Americans all at once. Sounds like a pretty fair fight to me. Overall though, more than 260,000 individuals fought in guerrilla forces in the Philippines during the Second World War, in some 277 separate units. Due to their efforts, the Japanese never truly occupied the Philippines, controlling only 12 of the island's 48 provinces before their home islands were nuked and they were forced to surrender. Without the sacrifices of these guerrillas, Operation Musketeer would very likely have fallen flat on its face and many more people would have died before the end of the war. But what are your thoughts? Did you know about Filipino guerrilla units in World War II? If you did, do you have any more information on the topic that you wish to share with us? It's a pretty big and messy subject indeed, and we're sure there's plenty to discuss in the comments below. And as per usual guys, just before you go, if you want to join our wider history community, make sure you check out the links in the description below, where we have our Discord if you want to interact with other history buffs, our Facebook if you want exclusive content posted only to there, and our Instagram for the same thing. Exclusive content is posted both on the Instagram and Facebook. Anyways guys, as always, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you learned something new.